We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Michael. I'm Maya. I'm Rami. And I'm Anise. And Gerald is still on vacation. But never fear. Today, we have Michael Laron with us. Listeners of the Monthly Book Club will remember Michael from our discussion of Senor Ziapa, Your Heart is a Muscle the Size of a Fist. Michael is a science fiction and fantasy author. His most popular series is his science fiction thriller, Android X. He is also a YouTuber at the Author Level Up channel, where he publishes videos for authors every week that help them become savvier authorpreneurs. Michael is a podcaster, too, and the, the co-host of the To Be Read podcast, where he talks, where he talks about the books he's currently reading. I'm going to do the sentence over again. Michael is a podcaster, too, and the co-host of the To Be Read podcast, where he talks about the books he's currently reading. You can check out the TBR podcast at tbrpodcast.com, and there's a link in the show notes. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me here. You know, it's funny. When, we, when I picked the story, I just grabbed it because I forgot to pick a story. <laughs> and, and the fact that we have speculative fiction in a straight-up sci-fi journal. I think it's our first sci-fi journal. I think we yeah, haven't be- had a straight up sci-fi journal. We've had like weird fiction in like literary journals and you're our guest. It's perfect. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> that, that really surprised me too, because I've read strange horizons in the past and I was reading this and I was like, this is kind of speculative. It's, it's like, I was, I was surprised this is something that they would publish. So it was a yeah, pleasant surprise. It, it definitely. Um, well, we'll definitely get into that because the story I think it gives us a lot to chew on and it's going to be an interesting discussion. And I want to welcome you. It's been a long time and I always enjoy talking to you on the show. So the summary of this week's story we read, oh, word number And he slows me. We read in Stone, Glass and Plastic by Jose Pablo Ariate. This is a speculative story that appeared in Strange Horizons. In this story, Sergio, uh, his job is to clean up graffiti. He goes, he's assigned a job every morning and he goes and he cleans up graffiti off buildings, off of desks, the insides of buildings, whatever. And one morning his job is to clean up uh, what is is considered mosaic graffiti, which is something he's never seen before. This wall is a scene that appears completely made up of mosaics. It's got stones, it's got little baubles, junk, plastic, eyeglasses. And when he gets close to it, he starts to touch it and he instantly sees the scene as if it's real life. He goes into like a trance and he can see the father being shot by a policeman. He can see the woman and the young child having to leave their home. And it really weighs on him. He goes back home and his wife has Alzheimer's. And it it weighs on him so much that he ends up going throughout the city looking for more of these mosaics and finding them. And each time he gets close to them, he can see the scene as if it's real life. And so he decides to try to figure out who's making these. And he goes from scene to scene until finally the artists appear. And they're not too happy that he's been going from scene to scene. And he want, they want to know what he has to do with the mosaics. And he asked them if he, they would be willing to make a mosaic for him. He doesn't have any money to give, but it's something important. And they start to turn, them, turn away. But one of the artists says, well, tell me, what, do you, what, what is it that you're trying to remember? And in the end, we see that they've made a mosaic. But it isn't his memory. It's a memory for his wife and his wife touches the mosaic and lights up as she remembers things from the past. And yeah, this story, mm, it it was a doozy. I actually cried. Did anybody else cry at the end of the story? No, just me. Okay, my heart did swell. (laughs) I felt felt the good things, it was very sweet. (laughs) You felt the yeah. good things. <laughs> I was not expecting to cry. Like it, it takes a lot for like the tears, and I had an actual tear. I was like, "Wow, I'm reading sci-fi that's making me cry." <laughs> so mm-hmm. let's start at the top level. Um, how did everybody like this story? Did you like it? Did you hate it? I enjoyed it. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect when I first started reading it. Like it, it, it started off very literary, and I liked the character, and I liked. What, you know what he was doing and what his backstory was um as he t- when he touched the the mosaic for the first time i was like kind of like what, what what's going on this doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. um and then there was a period right around the middle where i wasn't quite sure what was going on and then when the artist appeared that's when i i, I think i i got back into the story and i really enjoyed the ending of it um i listened to it did any of you guys listen to it 
I did too. And yeah, I, I okay. we can talk about that because the narrator had issues. Too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, yeah, we'll talk about that. I too. should say I listened maybe to the first third read and then I was like, I'm done. And then I just did the rest yeah. without yeah. the. <laughs> Not the narration. Yeah, it, was it, it the author? No. Uh, no, it was the editor of the magazine. The editor of the magazine reads a lot of the um, science fiction and puts it out as a they podcast. The authors. It's really cool. I think it's hard to get a lot of authors to do stuff like that. Like, just in mm -hmm. general, a lot of authors aren't great narrators, and a lot of authors are just nervous and not necessarily wanting to narrate. Um, and so she she does that. Um, New York Times has started doing getting authors to do their narrations. Some of them, but even they, the New, Yorker, even the, yeah. New Yorker, even they aren't getting everybody doing it. Only it's mm -hmm. kind of hit and miss. Um, but for me personally, I really loved it a lot more than I expected. I'm not sure how I would categorize this. Is this magical realism? Is it speculative? Like, what is it? Um, but whatever it is, I liked it. And um, I, I agree that as I was listening to it, um, I think it would have made for really great audio, but it wasn't done well. Um, and reading it was just an absolute delight. Yeah. Uh, when he first touched the mosaic, my note is, it's like reverse magic chalk. Remember the magic chalk yeah. you you came out to life? <laughs> yeah, I had yeah. that thought too. It was like, yeah. oh, magic chalk. <laughs> yeah. Only it's like magic debris and tchotchkes. <laughs> magic debris and tchotchkes. I love it. <laughs> Rami? Yeah, it was, I, I really liked it as well. I was wondering, how did you come across this story? My, is this Strange Horizons like a well-known publication? I guess it is. I didn't know that. There's a bunch of Hugo nominees that have been published in it, but I didn't know that because how do I find short stories? Um, short story free online <laughs> literary. <laughs> This is Enter. What <laughs> I do the literary version of Cat them. Roulette. <laughs> and you know what? I love it because I end up finding a ton of stories that I never, ever would have looked at. Like, I never would have read this on my own. I don't read science fiction. And when I do, I, I like, I'm very specific. I'll go out and look for a specific story. Like, I went out and got Girl with All the Gifts. Like, I, I knew what it was. And I went out and got it. And I don't just randomly just run into science fiction. And it was great because I wouldn't have discovered this magazine. I wouldn't have discovered this author. And I think this is something that I'm definitely going to stay with long-term because I enjoyed it a great deal. And as I went back and I looked at a lot of the fiction in Strange Horizons, a lot of it is very literary science fiction. And I love that. Like, that's what I was reading as a kid. My sci-fi had like a really strong literary bend and it was really strongly written and yeah i wouldn't have found it if i hadn't have just googled free story <laughs> online <laughs> enter <laughs> cool. i'm such a bad girl about that though yeah i i wasn't joking when i said i don't um i i don't preview my stories <laughs> poor remy he gets so nervous <laughs> This is a good thing. Well, thank you. <laughs> so this is this is a little odd because we all seem to really like the story. So let's just start with as far as how you would categorize the story, because to me this felt very literary. Um, it the use of language, um, the ideas. It, there's some really big ideas in here um, outside of the basic plot and the character development um, that really stuck with me. Um, it stuck with me for a while after the fact, and I can see myself thinking about the story. Like if I'm watching TV and I see someone with Alzheimer's, like this story is going to be in my subconscious. And to me, those are all marks of really strong literary fiction. And like Annie said, um, you know, there were elements that felt very magic chalk to me. So I would put this as magical realism. What would you categorize it as, Michael, since you actually have probably a little more knowledge of science fiction than I do? Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, to me, what this, I don't know if I could categorize, I'm still thinking, I've, I've been thinking about that all morning because I read it earlier this morning, like what genre this falls into. I don't necessarily know if it's science fiction. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it has science fiction elements, you know, with the, the, the memories and the mosaics. But you know what this really reminded me of when I was reading it? It reminded me, have you guys read the Joyce Carol Oates story, Where Have You Going, Where Have You Been? 
No, I haven't. No. Oh my goodness. Um, you guys have to, you have to read that for an, an episode. That's a fantastic story. Um, write it down. Anyways. Creepy as hell. Yeah, it, is, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it reminded me of that. Like it, I won't spoil it for you, but in that story, there's uh, this girl, she's, she's at home and there's this guy that comes to her door and it's just really creepy. Like what happens after that. And it kind of, without spoiling it, it kind of gave me that vibe, almost like a um, Flannery O'Connor, yeah, the wealthy Southern Gothic. W when the artist showed up, not not the beginning of the story, but yeah. when the artist showed up, like this really creepy, kind of come out of nowhere. You don't really find out who the names of these characters are, but they have this magical element about them. That's kind of what this reminded me of. Um, and I I, lo I love the Gothic, you know, weird stories. Yeah, like I can see how the second half could definitely have like that Gothic feel. Um, I didn't instantly go gothic and and for me i was very literal in this reading and annie this surprised me because a lot of times when i'm reading like magical realism i don't go literal so in my head i was thinking oh they're santeristas they're artists they're doing some sort of magic on the walls like that's just where my head was and i just accepted it as fact <laughs> mm -hmm. and at that point it was just like you know magical realism but it without that frame of reference i totally would have been like southern gothic you know, creepy. Are they real people? Are they gods? Like kind of thing. I could totally see that. Yeah. I didn't really pick up on the Southern Gothic thing as much, but I think I was sort of really infatu infatuated with all of the like little um, kind of like Latin American, American, like, you know, mm -hmm. the Latinos in the U S like all these little like things that had to do with that. So there were all these little lines that were like, when he talks about how there's a power here that my mother always said she never believed in, yeah. but that she always respected. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's very Latino as it well. Is. That's my yeah, grandma's absolutely. and my mom too, probably. Uh, and myself, like it passes down. And uh, um, so th I think that might also be why we're tempted to call it magical realism because we think magical realism, you think also of Latin literatures, Latin writers. And then it's, you know, there's a part of it that's like, well, you don't want to pigeonhole them in that. But at the same time, you have magic going on that nobody finds remarkable or strange. And it's just like, that's the thing that happens and just co coexists with it. So I think that's probably the best category for me. Yeah. And, you know, and I didn't even think about it being uh, Latin author. I'll, I mean, it, it's right front and center. It's a Latin author. It's very yeah, Latin it story. But um, as I was reading it, I was just right in the story. And Mm -hmm. But it is very Latin in a way that's not like, this is a Latin story. It, you just kind of accept it. It was like, oh, okay. Yeah, the things, the undercurrent, what, you know, the grandmothers and, you know, the things that are said, they were so pinpoint yeah. on the culture. The Café Bustelo, the brand of coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah I the only coffee. It was like, <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> I know where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yep. Yeah, no, that was, that was, yeah, I, it, you could definitely notice the the Latin element in it too. Sorry, I've got a uh, crying no, two in the background. I'm, I'm, I'm not too loud. <laughs> you want to tell us what she thought of the story? That's what I don't she think thought she of the story. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was uh, in Dreamland when I was reading it. So, I, <laughs> uh, Rami. What would you call this? Would you? Thank you. No, um, so I know this is just a general commentary. I know in the past also we've tried to, we've had stories when you had asked, you know, what is this or how would you describe this? And personally for me, and maybe this is also indicative of my lack of literary knowledge, because I, I just looked up what Southern Gothic is, I don't know. But when I read something, that's not necessarily the thing that I tried to do. Like, mm -hmm. and I used said using the word pigeonholing or categorizing a story. For me, a story is just a story and how good it is depends on my reaction to it, what sorts of emotions it elicited and, and how much I liked it. So unless, you know, like we said, if I don't think it's a short story, that's- the Unless it's a category he doesn't agree with, it just doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's important to look at that sometimes when we're talking yeah, about yeah, fiction that is I'm outside not, our normal wheelhouse. Because the story very much is outside of our normal wheelhouse from a magazine that's outside our normal wheelhouse, but then it isn't. And I think it's interesting to point out that regardless of the category, um, 
of fiction. There is literary fiction in all the genres. And I think it's a nice reminder that, you know, some sometimes when you read a ton of literary fiction, we can forget that a lot of genre fiction is literary. And, um, and I would like you know, to pick up more of those stories in the podcast. I would like to widen that a little bit. And I think that this was an interesting start. You know, I've never looked at Strange Horizons. It's a very well-known science fiction magazine. I had no idea. No, I, now I, I know. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, to me personally. Yeah, I see you're liking her. Yeah, you're getting like no, a million. No, that's, that, that's, that, that's somebody else. That's Ryan. Hi, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, no, He's I, my blonde husband. <laughs> Okay. No, I, I think I guess did. not. We had a divorce. <laughs> he says in the comments, "Hi, wifey." So I, I don't know if he knows about that divorce. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, Michael. <laughs> no, I. I was going to say no. You're you're totally right. Like as a reader, I haven't met a genre that I don't like. Like I, I'm a very optimistic, idealistic kind of reader. I love genres for what they can be because I know that with the right writer and the right writing style, they can write something that I'll enjoy. So mm -hmm. like for me, I, that's why I love your point. That's why I love that you said that, that good writing is good writing no matter where it is, right? It could be science fiction. And I think Jonathan, Jonathan, Jonathan in the comments mentioned um, Fahrenheit 451. That's another really good example of li very literary style writing in a science fiction genre. So, yeah, I, I, I think you just have to find more stuff like that. It's Yeah, I and, and I think that's, that's really good um, because it's really easy to get stuck in the new literary MFA writer hole and forget that there are so many genres of literary fiction out there. And... Um, yeah, it, it's an amazing thing. And you're right. I've never met a genre I don't like. I don't read a lot of some genres because of trends. And it's hard for me to find the books in those genres that I know that I would enjoy. Um, I find that it's easier for me to find literary horror. Um, like I can usually spot literary horror pretty quick. I find that it's fairly easy for me to find um, literary fiction that is really... Um, uh, like the price of salt, like um, telling Mr. Ripley, like my brain just fried. Mm, high tension. Someone, genre, name. <laughs> genre. What's the words leaving you hanging today? <laughs> it's yeah. not helping me at all. Like it's eight. You wake me up at eight o'clock in the morning. You don't finish my sentences. Come on, Annie's. You dropping the ball here. <laughs> just, I mean. <laughs> We've read so much stuff on this podcast that goes like, across you know what I mean? all the different. Like, there are certain yeah. genres yeah. that yeah. you can go to that genre, you can say, okay, I know who the literary people are in this genre. And then there's other yeah. genres where it's like, I don't know who they are. And so it's hard for me to find those books. Like Bird Box, yeah. how did I find that? I found it on YouTube. Yeah. The, the the one that I'm always like racking my brain to think of good literary examples that are contemporary would be like literary romance. Like what's a good contemporary literary romance? And this is because on the monthly podcast, I want a romance writer to come on as a guest to do a literary romance. And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's a really hard one because it's such a yeah. big genre and there are so many stories and books to find mm -hmm. who are the people that are doing the literary versions of it. I don't I, know. I, and you can find it in in older fiction. Yeah, Actually, like, like he just, just mentioned, mentioned Bram Stoker. Like, horror, but like it's yeah, but it's very literary horror. It's easier in yeah. older fiction and romance yeah. because yeah. we know it's been judged already. But yeah. you know, when you're talking about finding contemporary authors, a lot of times um, they haven't really been assessed, and so you don't really know going in. Like to me, mm -hmm. I can think of two examples off the top of my head. The first would be um, Nora Roberts, and some people are going to crucify me for saying that, but I think her style. No, is I can very see good. that. I think it that's why good. it crosses over out of just out of um, straight romance. There's a lot of yeah. contemporary readers that read Nora Roberts who don't read other formats. It, exactly, her style just is just very sumptuous and very flowing. Um, another author, I, I can't think of the author's name, but there's a book. It's called The Year of Living Famously. Um, and that was published within like the last six or seven years, I think. And that's a fantastic book. Um, yeah. It's, there's I don't another know if author. You guys have read it. There's another author, Sylvia Day or something like that, who no, 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 is no. also. 
No, it's not Sylvia Day. It's about um, it's about a woman who falls in love with a movie star, mm-hmm. and um, you know they get oh, married. I think I heard about this. They're living the lifestyle, and you know it's not all it's cracked up to be. And um, it's just a really great. It, it's it's almost more chiclet territory, but mm-hmm. I really. I mean, it still has all the romantic elements. But it still, it has all the romance elements and it's still pushing the limits. And I think that is the mark of of literary fiction is fiction that's pushing those limits. And I feel like this story is pushing several limits. One Mm. of the things that I appreciate about this story compared to some of the other stories we've read from really, really well-known Latin writers is that, okay, so Juno Diaz, like, we historically know I've had issues with Juno Diaz's short stories and writing. I love him. I love this man. I keep reading his stuff because I want to love his writing because I just, if he was in front of me, oh, Juno. Okay. Now that we've had that moment, <laughs> like, I adore this man. But one of the things that is really difficult for me when I'm reading his stuff is that, um, and also one of the things that's amazing about his writing is he brings in the culture and he brings in the language, which is really important to have in our literature, but he does it in a way that's that's jarring. And that kind of like, for me, when I read it, it's like a hiccup. This writer, it's sad that he's not that well known because he's bringing in those elements, but it's very fluid. It's in a way that is like, okay, I know where I'm at. I know what this culture is. That's really cute. That's a total signpost, but I'm not confused. And I don't feel those same hiccups that I get when I read some of Juno Diaz's work. And Annie's gonna crucify me now for that. Well, I love (laughs) Juno Diaz, but you're right. I get all the references. So, you know, it's easier for me. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Although I will say from the Latin authors that we've read on this podcast, I think this one's the most optimistic. Like as soon as I thought it was going to be agree. dreary, yeah, when the artist is like, life is about loss, but then the protagonist is like, no, it's not just about that. You have to have things to lose, basically. Like there's other things or else you can't have loss without having something to lose is basically his point. And then what he wants is to recreate those good things for his wife. And it's kind of sweet, which I'm not really used to in one magical realism. Magical realism could be Are you saying that Latin people aren't sweet? And- <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. No, you have a point. Yeah. And in general, in general, literary authors as a whole, regardless of Guilty. ethno-cultural Guilty. identity, yeah, are like sad and dreary. But. Guilty as charged. <laughs> no, that's you're right, though. And you make a good point, because that that is one of the things that stuck with me about the story was the fact that it was a happy ending. Like. Yeah. I, I guess you wouldn't. Know, I wouldn't know if you could classify it as happy, but it, it certainly it was, wasn't. It was an optimistic. It was it a wasn't great sad. ending. It was. It was what I would consider a very Buddhist ending. It was. You know, it left you thinking, but it right. wasn't sad. But I was still crying. Yeah, so. and I think that's rare, to, to, at least to me. And, and a lot of the, the the literary stuff that I've read. I mean, it's. I, I feel like every other short story I, I read when I was reading literary fiction was like, after John's mother died, he went and. <sighs> on a vacation and found himself and the end of the story is him walking into the, the, the ocean. You know? like, yeah. It's just not, it, it, it doesn't start on a happy note. It doesn't end on a happy note. And it's just, you know, and, I, and that's why I like the story. It was enjoyable. Mm-hmm. It's funny you say that. Cause it just reminded me of every single acting class I ever took as a kid, because like you're just being so dramatic and it's just so much fun to be dramatic and miserable. Yeah. And I think sometimes as writers, it's like, Ooh, I get to do something. Ooh, how can I make it worse? Let's make it worse. Let's make it worse. And then it's yeah. like, okay. Um, it is, it is harder. I think though, to write a story with this level of optimism and have it not come off as sentimental and saccharine. Mm-hmm. And this author definitely succeeds in my opinion. Um, I think a lot of times why, some literary writers per- avoid these types of, of happier endings is because it is so easy to cross over into that realm. Um, and I think it's because this ending felt balanced to me. It didn't have an answer. Um, I felt like it was realistic. And at the same time, there was a pleasure that the narrator had in his life and watching his wife relive those memories, even if she never came out and relived them again. And that to me was very pleasurable. 
And I know in my own writing, I tend to write a lot of really gray area endings. And that's why I can't be a romance writer because I'm like, look, there's a happily ever after. And they're my critique group's like, that's not a happily ever after. <laughs> I don't know what planet you're on that that's a happily ever after. I'm like, okay, I guess I fail. <laughs> well, the thing is, I was confused about that part because... I would have thought that maybe he would have done something like in that movie, Fifty First Dates with Adam Sandler. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where no. the, the I avoid his him. Sorry. wife and girlfriend and then wife has like memory issues, but then he makes like a video to keep reminding her in the morning, like, this is who you are. We have a family, all this, like that was their solution. So I thought, okay, so the mural's there. So maybe, you know, every day you just take her and, and have her relive it again. Like, I don't know why it like that. The the artist who did it made it seem like this was like a one off kind of thing. Well, it's, it's not going to bring back all her memory. She goes, she touches it. She only relives the memory in the mural. It's not a cure. She still has Alzheimer's. It's better than nothing. And, and it is a one off for the artist because the artist up before this one wasn't doing happy memories she was only doing grim memories uh and that was also part of the authors the, the trio's worldview so the authors were like life is lost and it's a little bit of like uh you get justice through memory and accountability by showing what happened and who did it that's a, a form of justice for that loss that's the artist's worldview and that's why they were only doing sort of like dreary murals but the protagonist said he he's like no, life's not just about that and convinces them to do the happy memories, but that is a one-off for them because they don't share that well, worldview. I was saying one-off in terms of, okay, she remembers now, but she's never going to remember it again type of thing. Like that's the impression that they seem to be giving. Yeah, and I, I think the protagonist knows that. He, so it's funny. It's like they both agree life is about loss, but one yeah. sees that as a good thing and the other one sees it as a negative thing because mm -hmm. the one who sees it as a good thing is like, because there's actual good things to lose. That's why it's great. And the other one's just like, no, as soon as you lose something, that's a tragedy and that's more important. Yeah, and I think that that is a really important part of the story because while it really focuses on the narrator, there is a growth trajectory in the artist. When we see them, they're in shadows, um, they're very gruff, uh, they speak in very short sentences sentences, which gives you a tone for them. Um, and that was just perfect. And as they're turning him away, because he suggests, he's like, can you do one for me? And, and they laugh. They're like, what, for money? We don't do this. For he's like, no, I don't have any money. And they're laughing. And two of the artists are starting to turn away. And it's the woman, the small woman that says, no, wait, tell me more. That opens up that door and there's a need in her to s figure out what's up with this guy. Like, you know, there, there, there's something about him that is attractive to her. And at the end, when they're looking at the mural, she's watching and she's growing from this experience too. And I thought that was really interesting to have it be her and have her be there as the wife touches the wall and relives those memories. It was really powerful to me um, to, to have that, you know, if, if something happens in a forest and no one's there to see it, did it really happen kind of thing. It's like not only is the wife remembering, but there is a witness to the event there that isn't the husband. There's a witness to this love and this coming together and the caretaking. And I think that that is really interesting. Yeah. And witnessing is important for the artists, as they said. That's why they do this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are we ready to talk? Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, that, that that's almost a turning point for the artists too, mm -hmm. because they're, they're, making the graffiti or the mosaics in alleys, you know, or on the sides of buildings and places where they're not necessarily having a witness. And so the fact that they have one for the first time, maybe that's an optimistic outlook, right? Maybe they're not going to focus on the bad memories now. Maybe the artists are going to focus on the good along with the bad. And so it balances them as well. Yeah. It, it, it was wonderful. Um, Remy? What's up? Okay, never mind. <laughs> Are we ready to talk about language? I've been holding this off because, yeah, me and this writer, I think I love him. 
Cover your ears, Ryan. <laughs> oh, great. It'd Sorry. It's interesting to know what kinds of other stories he's done because I don't know, for some reason, I feel like this story in particular, it's it seems to me like it was something that he had in his mind for like a while and finally like put down because I don't know it's just it's so creative that I feel like it's something that you might have been like dreaming about as a kid or something like that I don't see like someone waking up one day and it's like oh I'm gonna just do this and this is gonna happen and that I don't know <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, that's one thing I didn't do is I didn't look up his other stuff, you know, to see what else he's written. He's written a lot, um, but I didn't look it up yet, although I will. Um, I'm hoping that his other fiction is as tightly spun as this is, uh, because I felt like the language was very, very tight. I felt like as I was reading it, you know, one of the things I like is when I'm reading a story that has beautiful language, but doesn't feel like there's a lot of extra, there wasn't a lot of fluff, it's not calling attention to itself. It was just very, very nice. And I felt like this, again, was very tight. There wasn't anything that bothered me about the language at all, or, or really like stood out to call attention to itself until after the fact. I was like, oh, well, that was beautiful. Yeah, I also really liked the stream of consciousness when he would touch the mosaic, because it... So that's really clever because he's not using any punctuation. So you can very quickly get lost. But it's something I did have to reread, but it wasn't in a way that was frustrating. This, I think the disorientation is also intentional. And mm -hmm. I like that because there was no punctuation, it was all one case, a blurb. It gave you the feeling of uh, impression. Like, because Sergio isn't like watching this like a movie and telling you what's happening. It, all of it is known to him at the same time. He knows he's the boy. He knows that's his father. He knows that the situation is tense. The way that in a dream, like you see a tree, but you know the tree is your dad. Like you just know. <laughs> so it's yeah. like one of those kinds of things um, that I thought the stream of consciousness communicated really well. It was really creative and difficult to pull off. Um, I, I think in less deft hands, um, it wouldn't have gone as well. And I, I know that there's another author who does stuff like that. But I can't. Think. Yeah, there's a few. Yeah, you know. I just like the way that he did it here specifically to communicate that sense of like yeah. when you just know. It, it what it does for me. I, I've I've talked about creative punctuation in the past, and you, I think Remy might have snickered at me a little bit because I think I went off on like someone's semicolon usage and how beautiful it was or something, um, <laughs> equally geeky and absurd. But um, I felt like that portion is an example of creative use. Of punctuation, creative use of typography. Um, and I think it's something that's interesting to explore how s even these minute changes can affect the tone of a story or the message of the story or the message of a passage. And in this case, it was very, it was used to great effect. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't, you know, I, I have to confess that I listened to this, so I, I didn't actually read it. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't, get a chance to see language. I mean, there was nothing that jumped out at me, but there was nothing that I like now that you say that, that the, 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 the flashbacks were a stream of consciousness. I sense. didn't know that. I thought that, I was like, what the heck is a narrator doing? Like I, I thought, <laughs> I thought they spliced another story into the story at first. And then, you know, when she jumped back, I thought, oh, okay, okay. So that was a flashback. Yeah. So, it, it wasn't done great on the audio. <laughs> yeah. But no, I thought, first, oh yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't even really, I don't think flashback's the right word because it's like, it's more yeah, it's like. it's not really a flashback. Yeah, it's like, it's a, like a, it's a vision. A other. <laughs> a vision, I don't know I what guess. you would call it. Yeah, I don't know what the, tr what the name, what the true name for that trope would be. But, An experience um, yeah. in someone else's world. Yeah. Sense eight, that's what it is. Sense eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like you touch something and get a memory from it. I'm trying to think of that TV show. Wasn't there a TV show where. Like a yeah. guy, the guy could touch someone and he would he could know everything that they knew uh -huh. for like ten minutes. I don't remember the name of that show, but uh, I don't remember either. But there was there was, and then there's I Zombie where if you eat someone's brains, you can know how they died. So you know, go figure. <laughs> it's, it's a trope. Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also Sorry, really like. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just gonna say I like that also that moment where he's like worried that am I losing my mind? Was that a seizure? Was that a stroke? Who's going to take care of Carolina? 
And then when he gets the second vision from the mural, the second memory, that relief where he's like, yes, it's weird magic. I can't explain externalized for me. I'm not crazy. <laughs> like, this is a thing that is external. And I really like that because that felt, that's something that I've been thinking about mm -hmm. kind of forever. Um, Have you been that, having visions? Hmm? Have you been having visions? No, I, well, no. <laughs> but just in general, like that idea of, uh, are you going crazy or is it external? In fact, mm -hmm. there's a short story I'm working on that plays with that. There's like a woman who's like, she doesn't actually know, like, am I just crazy or is this like a legitimate external curse that if I don't obey, I'm going to die? And then that, the way that that controls her life, that tension. Um, so then having, having seen like a smaller version of that in this story was really exciting. Yeah, definitely. Now, what, what did you notice any symbolism in the story that stood out to you? Well, first would be the Alzheimer's and the mosaics being touch points for memories. Um, mm -hmm. That was the, the, I think, the most obvious for me. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that the mosaics were composed of small pieces of life. So the mosaics weren't just glass, uh, like broken glass that you would normally use for mosaics. There were pieces of, you know, plastic and glasses. And when they made the mosaic for her, they put things in the mosaic from her life, like pieces of her wedding dress and things like that. And I thought that that was really interesting. And it also, looking back at the destruction, because one of the reasons why, you know, one of the things he says to them is, I can find you a place where no one will take it down. So they've been creating these mosaics out of people's lives and memories and then they've been taken down and his wife her memories have been taken down and they've replaced the memories and those memories aren't going to be taken down until it, until he's as long as he's alive and i thought that was a really interesting symbol going on it was beautiful a little mm -hmm. bit of reflection yeah. yeah. Also his job is in a way expunging memory. Like mm -hmm. think about graffiti as somebody you know claiming themselves and a point. Not always, sometimes it's just like <laughs> but you know, to, to a certain degree, yes, all of them have an element of that and his job is to get rid of that. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but there's an interesting tension there. Yeah, there is an interesting tension there and I love how he described the different types of graffiti. I had a chuckle. Um I thought it was just like just perfect. And I was like, yeah. yep, you're a school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Who lives in Epcot? Yeah, I saw that. I was like, how do you, he, does he really live in Epcot? I, well, I was going to ask that too. <laughs> well, and the, another thing said he lived in Brazil. So is Epcot more than one thing? No, no, no. The Brazil thing was the illustrator. Yeah, it was the illustrator. Oh, okay. Okay. I was confused. Yeah, but Epcot, uh, yeah, because Walt Disney had a dream about, like, the city of tomorrow. That's always the city of tomorrow. Like, it's constantly being upgraded to be ahead of, like, the rest of America. And he built it, but it's technically not in Disney World proper. It's, like, a property to the side. Do people I didn't actually live there? In there. I, I didn't know. Apparently. I, he lives or maybe, in maybe he's just being, maybe he's just being clever in his description. You know? yeah, exactly. Maybe he's yeah. just clever. Maybe we're taking him way too literally. Yeah. We're such literary readers that we read a science fiction author. We're like, oh, well, he said it must be true. So. Lives in Epcot. <laughs> it's in his bio. I would have thought that usually when people are writers, they're more like English. <laughs> he's our resident reader. You have to give him a pass, Michael. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just want to know, like, you know, can you go live in Epcot? Because that's the case, then that's what I'm doing. You're out. You're out. You're gonna move your family. Just to watch out for the alligators. Yeah, there's that. If there it's a city that. tomorrow, maybe there are no alligators, or they have like, you know. Um, the alligators have been around since the dinosaurs. I think they're gonna be around long after us. <laughs> long after us. Matter of fact, they may be the next. <laughs> the next people. <laughs> exactly. There's like, you know, yo, people. Yeah, we're done with you. <laughs> Take over alligator people. No crab people. <laughs> so is there anything else about the story that we wanted to touch on before we went ahead and rated it? Okay, well, I'm going to rate it. I'm giving this story a very, very, very strong six. Nice. Yeah. It's a it, scale it, one to six, Michael. Okay. Yeah, I did. Like <laughs> That's the highest. Okay, I didn't okay. feel like there was anything, um, like it. 
for me to read science fiction, it feels so emotionally involved, regardless of whether it's science fiction or magical realism, because we've read a lot of magical realism where I feel like it's much more of a cerebral story and I'm not necessarily emotionally involved. You know, um, Very Old Man with Enormous Wings. I love that story, but I wasn't feeling bad. Like I didn't cry. I wasn't emotionally invested in that way. It was a different type of story. And I felt like this story touched on my emotions. It was beautifully written. It had interesting ideas. There was a lot of resonance in different parts of the story, a lot of resonance and some symbology that could be pulled out. And so, um, yeah, I feel like it deserves that six. I would give it a five. Um, just because I got lost in the middle a little bit. Um, <laughs> But I love the ending and I love the opening and I love the characters and I loved everything the story stood for. So definitely thoroughly enjoyed it. Rami? I'll also give it a six. Um, I want to mention also, because in stories in the past, we talked about how when you use, you know, cultural references and words and other languages and stuff, that sort of, sort of throws you off. But I mean, in this one, I just, I had to look up some things and like leave the story and, and, and get back to it. But I, I didn't really take issue with that as much. I, I just considered it learning new words. So I don't know. I think he, he weaved the cultural references pretty nicely. And I think it was an all around great story. Yeah. So I'm torn between a five and a five and a half, but I think I'm going to go five and a half for optimism. Half a point just for not being dreary. It really happens on this show. Almost all our shows were like, and then we walked away depressed. <laughs> and then he jumped in the ocean and the dog died. <laughs> exactly. And then she never found the note that was in the drawer and she doesn't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, oh, why would you think that went up? Um, oh man, that story. It's like that episode of Golden Girls where... <laughs> Blanche wants to know. It if, kind of was a Golden Lily Girls like short story. Oh it was a and it was uh, uh, about four old ladies who are friends. <laughs> so it is kind of a Golden <laughs> Girls. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Gerald had a hard time with that one. <laughs> no. Okay, so I think that's really interesting that we all rated it really, really, really highly. I think that's yeah, pretty awesome. Really a lot of times um, we're, we're a lot more divergent on that. So for today's quiz, it is a speculative fiction quiz. And I'm going to do three questions each. Actually, no, I'm not going to do three questions. I'm going to let you guys steal. Yeah. You don't want to be here forever. We, yeah, we let's don't. steal. Let's mm. steal. Let's, let's okay. do this. Okay. So since Mike is our guest, he gets to go first. And what Wait. are the stories you guys are submitting? Give, give me a minute! <laughs> Jeez! <laughs> no. Like it's never happened before. Like it's never I happened. I know, but give me a chance. <laughs> yeah. Do you see? That's my other wife. Yeah. <laughs> this is my other, she's my podcast wife. Yeah. <laughs> Podcasting like, polygamy. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So what stories are we submitting today? Submitting like to magazines? No, no. Just, what are you putting in the pool? Oh, I made it. I may have forgotten. See, I had too many things going on. Oh, uh, you forgot to tell him? It's fine. He already made a recommendation on his own. He yeah, recommended James Carol book. Oates. That was a book. No, that's a short story. It's a, it's a short, short story. story. Is it available for free online? That's what I, I was just going to check. I think so. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty famous story, though. So I, I'm pretty sure you could find it. Just, just check real quick because we don't want to go there. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Yep, I found it. We're yeah. good. Okay, we're good. Go. Okay, so that'll be your submission. So what is he submitting? Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? by Joyce Carol Oates. Classic short story. Okay, Anais? Uh, Silver Blaze by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It's a Sherlock Holmes short story. Nice. Hey, I'm up, up for some Sherlock. I'm, okay. I'm up. I'm up for it. Remy? Mine is The Looking Glass by Anton Chekhov. I like Chekhov. Now I can't decide who I want to win. Okay, good thing I don't have to decide because we're doing this using a quiz. Yeah. Okay. Woohoo. So, Michael, you're first because I wouldn't know the answers to any of these. And I have a feeling you all are going to know these answers, but I tried. 
Uh, from The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, what is Gollum's real name? I have no earthly idea. Can I steal? Yeah, I've read the series like twice. I don't know. Stealing work. You, you need to make a it goes clockwise. Um, the order is Michael, Annie, Remy. Okay. Oh, somebody steal it. I don't know. Annie's? I can steal then? Yeah. Smeagol. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Smeagol. Yeah. Okay. Annie's, your question is, from the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan, what, re what region is Perrin from? I don't know this. You don't know this? I haven't read Wheel no. of Time. Me neither. I still have the patience. <laughs> Okay. What? Don't, what is it, Remy? It's not multiple. It would have been nice to have it as multiple choice. <sighs> you guys didn't yeah. give me multiple choice last week. Well, but you won anyway. Last week, I thought <laughs> the, the answers are pretty easy. Like, <laughs> hey, I thought the answers are pretty easy too. So she didn't get it. Nobody like, got so, it. No big deal. I mean, how define region? Is it like north, south, east, west, or what? What region is Perrin from? Yeah, but what do you mean by region? There are read the book. regions in the book. Have you read the book? No. Okay, so you're no, not going to win it, so let's move on. <laughs> like, <laughs> Michael, can you steal? Asking for <laughs> he's from North America. <laughs> no, he's from two two streams. Okay. I, I mean, I two rivers. Somebody had to answer. <laughs> okay. No. Um, Remy. Yeah. <laughs> he's mad at me now. He's like, well, you won it anyway. I could have not. Okay, here we go. Uh, from the Discworld books by Terry Pratchett, how many elephants does the great Otun carry? See, it's a number you can guess. All right. How many elephants is the guy carrying? The great Otun carry. Where was he going? Um, He swims through the universe carrying elephants. He's from the Yoruba religion, Otun. He's yeah. Uh, God of what, but yeah, he's a god. He's a big so one. So he was carrying elephants and swimming in a river? Um, mm -mm, mm -mm, it's kind mm -mm. of tough to do, 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 do I know, that's a lot to carry. Well, <laughs> even when you're standing, I think it's um, <laughs> Let's go with two. And Michael, can you steal? Would it be six? Annie's, can you steal? Four? You got it. Oh. <laughs> what up? That was She's a guess. Like, oh, yeah. Guess <laughs> my way to a four. <laughs> Raising the literary roof. <laughs> okay, Michael. From the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling, which house does Harry Potter belong to? Gryffindor. Gryffindor! See, I, can, I can answer that. That's... <laughs> I feel good now. All right. <laughs> We're tied, on these. Uh, no, she got two. She stole one. Oh, okay. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and she stole two, What is written on the cover of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Aside from the author's name in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, what's written on the cover? Oh, my God. You know this. I do, and I'm, like, blanking. Oh, come um, on. You know this. Yeah. Oh, my God. Michael knows this. I can see it from his like, expression. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I I don't remember. I'm blanking. I'm like seeing it like in that bookshelf, but I can't. I can't. You go can't to look. It, so. You can't yeah. see. You can't like side okay. eye. You know. You, you can't like mysteriously need to check the powder on your nose. <laughs> yeah. I gotta pee, guys. I gotta pee. <laughs> Rami, do you know the answer? Don't panic. <sighs> Rami stole one. Beef. <laughs> Okay, Rami. What's up? From Dune <gasps> by Frank Herbert. What was mined on the planet Arrakis? Diamonds. Michael, <laughs> can you steal? Salt. Really? <laughs> This is classic no. science fiction, Mr. Science I, Fiction Guy. Yeah, I never I can never get into the Dune series. I I, what about I got the movie. You, know, you never I never the saw movie? the movie. Oh my no, god, I, the movie is like I can so never finish just it. 
wonderfully, I I, perfectly. I have. need to revisit it. No, no, Ana <laughs> needs go for it. I know you know it. Yeah, unless there was a more specific name, but it's the spice. Control the spice. Control the universe. Thank you. It's the spice. The spice. <laughs> Because if you control well, that's the kind of close. I said salt. Yeah, you're there. You're there. But it's, but it's not salt. Spice. Yeah. It's spice. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, guys. And so, obviously, given how this went and Annie's frequent stealing, Annie, Please. what are we reading next week? We are reading Silver Blaze by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It's a Sherlock Holmes short story. But cool. before you go read that, tell us what memory you'd like preserved in a mosaic in the comment section at literaryroadhouse.com. Also, reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spreaker are not considered graffiti and are cherished for time immemorial. We vandalize other literary works and writing on our other shows, the Literary Roadhouse Book Club and the Bradbury Challenge. Our podcasts, like graffiti, are free to enjoy, but not free to create. You can help keep us going by supporting our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash literaryroadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with your friends. Until next time, read a good read story. A good story. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. We slice that later, but yeah. <laughs> so perfect. I love yeah. your outros. They're always wonderful. Yeah, and that was fantastic. <laughs> yes, it is. It's always about the spies. <laughs> you know, yeah. I loved that movie. It is so cheesy because, like, you know, some special effects age well and some don't. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is so perfect. It really is perfect. And like Catching hitchhiking on the spice worms. I always wanted to hitchhike on a spice worm. I wanted to catch <laughs> one and just be all like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my childhood right there, man. <laughs>